All right. Well, thank you everyone for joining today's new product update webinar. My name is Sunny Galani, and today we'll be talking about ARM-based industrial networking processors for Industry 5.0. Um, feel free to share any questions uh, during the presentation. Um, we'll try to answer it as, as, we, speak, uh, as we get them. Um, and there will also be a live Q&A uh, portion at the end. So if you'd like to ask a question at that point, um, feel free to, to do that as well. So with that, we'll uh, go ahead and get started. All right, so um, today we'll be covering um, a few topics. One, uh, just what is Industry 4.0? Uh, two, uh, it will be about around uh, industrial protocols. Uh, what are they and why are they so important? Um, and three, what are some of, what is kind of what PI is doing um, in terms of PI solutions uh, to enable Industry 4.0? And some of our partners as well. Um, and then open it up to a Q&A at the end. So. We'll try to cover the first uh, first four topics um, uh, pretty well, and then and but even then, if you have any questions of, uh, as we go through the presentation, um, please feel to send them in. Feel free to send them in. Thank you. All right. So first off, uh, what is uh, this uh, industry 4.0, and what is uh, what is this evolution kind of the, these trends? Uh, where are they moving? Um, so really, Industry 4.0 is enabled, or focusing on enabling uh, connected smart factories. And if we look at um, what's happening in the industry today, we see a lot more focus on advanced sensors and communication, um, and uh, to really enable that real-time communication. Um, two, it's around uh, really intelligent horizontal vertical network systems. We see that by ways of um, advancing to connected robots and in um, uh, more enhanced software. Uh, and then number three is uh, just seeing, we see more and more our factories adapt uh, dynamically uh, by, you know, changes in uh, supply chain, changes in demand, uh, global changes, and uh, they are doing this by constantly analyzing collected data uh, for more rapid decision making. And as we see kind of this the shift towards this industry 4.0 that I described, uh, really we see the shift kind of go into and have, have been going in phases, right? We started back um, in the early 1800s really around how do we harness power uh, to, to make things. Um, and so whether that was, you know, looking at water power, steam power, um, it, and then converting that energy that was where a lot of that early focus was, Industry 1.0. 2.0 really focused on how do we uh, mass produce, right, uh, a lot of our, our goods uh, and tightening some of the quality control so variations from product to product, are those deviations are minimized. Uh, 3.0 focused more on computer automation um, and really improving that efficiency overall, uh, changing, moving from manual assembly more towards automated assembly. And really where we are is in this fourth stage here um, where we're um, kind of entering the world of more intelligent robotics. These systems are more connected together uh, and, uh, and also dynamically talking and, and adapting in real time. <clears throat> Quick fun fact for you all here. Um, back in 1977, actually TL TI uh, it developed the very first TLC. It was field bus based, um, but uh, you know we actually have been part of this journey from the very beginning, uh, and so it's really cool to see as we continue to evolve um, our you know PI's role in that and enabling that journey um, is uh, is very key as well. <clears throat> as we kind of look at those protocols and those trends, um, and let's see if I can get. There we go. This slide's advanced here. Uh, if you look at these protocols and these trends, right, um, on the communication side, that's kind of where a lot of the, the changes have happened over the years. Um, around 2019, you can see a lot of that communication was field bus based, um, or was still field bus based, but growing into more industrial Ethernet. And, and we continue to see that growth of just industrial Ethernet um, as even today, 
So uh, field bus is still a very big part of the market, and that's kind of where or a lot of the original innovation or original communication lines uh, uh, operated off of. But as we move uh, kind of into the future, we continue to see that industrial Ethernet uh, high uh, continue to really grow. Uh, you do see a little bit of wireless growth, um, but uh, it is a lot smaller. And I'll actually um, uh, speak to that a little bit as to why uh, in, a, in a couple of slides or so. And as we look at, kind of break down that industrial Ethernet further, one of the reasons why it is a lot more ubiquitous now um, is that we started to see, we start to see a lot more, <clears throat> a much bigger breakdown. So um, look at Profinet uh, and its adoption in the market today, Ethernet, Ethernet IP, uh, Ethercat, right? Some of these key protocols have continued to be very prevalent and continue to grow market share. Um, as compared to some of the other uh, other uh, protocols, field bus based protocols that are out there, um, there are others like um, Modbus, uh, PowerLink, CC Link uh, that continue to, to be very strong as well, especially in, in certain regions. Um, but some of these, these key three uh, ones, right, Profinet, Ethernet IP, and Ethercat, uh, continue we see, continue to see that uh, pretty dominating um, across regions, a lot many regions. If you go into kind of, and this is where I'll touch a little bit on that uh, wireless piece, right? If we look at uh, a lot of these systems today, um, it can kind of be broken down, or a lot of times we talk about it in three different levels. Um, we've got the field level, so that those, these are the communication. Um, this is where the activity is actually happening, whether it's in the actual uh, manufacturing, uh, robotics, right, the actual um, uh, uh, machinery that's on the factory floor line. Then you kind of go one level up to the PLCs, what we call control level, um, and then one level higher than that, the operator level. Now, an operator level may be, for example, not even inside the factory, maybe outside the factory or in a remote location. So sometimes that distance, uh, right, you, you can afford that distance at the operator level, whereas the field level, you're, that's where a lot of the, the decentralized, a lot of the more immediate latency, uh, you know, tighter requirements on latency um, is really critical or key. Um, <clears throat> and at that field level, right, that's where we see a lot of, uh, you know, kind of the adoption or disbursement of different uh, protocols as well. Um, certain protocols are very good for certain tasks. Um, and so we see a lot of different uh, wired-based uh, communication protocols kind of living in the same system at field level. Um, and then as we kind of go up to the operator side, right, that's where we start to see more cloud connection, more HMI, so display-based uh, uh, um, user input, um, and uh, just overall more intelligence kind of coming in uh, uh, that can make more macro changes to the entire system. So that's kind of how we break down uh, a a lot of what you see, kind of whether it's the factory floor or oil and gas distribution or supply chain, a lot of these factories or, or warehouses kind of share these same tiers. Uh, and we, we uh, often talk about it in that way. So <clears throat> let's take a step back. What is industrial networking? And specifically, what is industrial Ethernet? So as we look at uh, industrial networks today, right? And I mentioned a little bit about manufacturing plants um, and uh, distribution facilities, but we a lot of times see industrial networks connecting um, a, a lot of different types of uh, um, systems that uh, touch us uh, day in and day out, whether it's our power grid, um, and building automation, we talk about little, we talk a little bit about logistics and warehouses and control centers. Uh, it's, it's kind of, it really does go way beyond manufacturing where we see uh, these industrial networks today. And the, these networks are connecting sensors, um, equipment, and control systems um, to really help with centralized and decentralized control. So what do I mean by that? So centralized control is where we're making, you know, kind of more of the decisions at, uh, at, a, uh, at a top level across multiple systems. Uh, and that could be, for example, a control room. 
uh, where some of those macro changes are pushed through. But there's also a greater need uh, and trend growing for decentralized control. Um, a lot of these systems, as they get larger and larger and larger, right, start to introduce, for example, time delay, or uh, they may not be as real time able to react in real time. Um, so uh, by decentralizing some of these decisions also, uh, uh, it enables these individual systems to react a lot quicker. So <clears throat> we see both a trend in centralized and decentralized systems. Uh, obviously, real-time monitoring or remote, even based monitoring and maintenance, uh, and then data uh, collection uh, for advanced analytics and optimization. And that could be whether it's for um, for scalability, for upgradeability, or even being able to supply or sorry uh, uh, support uh, multi multiple suppliers. Uh, so especially in, in this day and age, um, you know where we have had periods of uh, supply chain uh, break, uh, breaks, you know, across uh, uh, whether it's uh, through um, uh, for different regional reasons or cost reasons or, or whatever, what may it be, being able to support multiple suppliers at different times and being able to insert them in um, becomes key as well, right? So you want to have that flexibility built in. So. And, Overall, right, these industrial networks are, are needing to be very flexible uh, to cover all of these different tasks. In addition, a lot of times these industrial networks are operating in very harsh environments, um, and they have to cover very large distances uh, and uh, be upgradable. So as factories expand or add sophistication, right, the industrial networks need to be able to adapt as well. Industrial networks can also, because of this, they also reduce operational costs uh, by improving product quality, um, improving throughput or productivity, and then just continuing to be able to scale, which uh, I covered. So how do we achieve this? Um, is a lot of times industrial net Ethernet is really, um, it really ends up being the answer, a clear winner. Uh, because it has a very standard-based max file layer uh, and its ability to support real-time, very deterministic data. Uh, so we continue to see Ethernet-based protocols um, evolving. And then, like I shared, there's many different types out there uh, that have different advantages uh, and, um, and are used for different parts of the system. And we continue to see that growing. Now, that's not without some downside. Uh, so some of the challenges that we have with industrial Ethernet today uh, include, uh, one is, is lack of unified networks. If you look at a lot of the Ethernet-based protocols that are out there, um, they don't really operate with each other very nicely. They don't speak to each other. Um, and uh, often a lot of these Ethernet networks were actually developed by different standards bodies um, where the target features and the performances are not very uh, convergent, right? So um, to the end of that, some, some of these Ethernet uh, uh, standard bodies actually view other uh, protocols as maybe a competitor as well. So you have to deal with interoperability. And sometimes that actually uh, gets us to where we um, – get end customers to where they've got to actually support uh, or manage heterogeneous networks. That can be a challenge sometimes. Um, and also, not all networking equipment is uh, IEEE compliant. Um, so one very good example of this is EtherCAT and Cofinet, for example. Um, both of these actually have non-standard switch in hardware. Uh, and so uh, you know, that can lead to uh, more special special Macs for both the device and switch um, that uh, requires a modification in hardware design as well as software. Um, all right, so what does the future of networking look like? Um, so as we move further uh, from industrial Ethernet, now we've got to start to build on industrial Ethernet. One of the, uh, the key hot uh, areas of topic is actually time-sensitive networking, or TSN. 
so CSN is really a collection of 20 plus IEEE standard bodies that are kind of working together um, to create more uh, more convergence um, across the various uh, set of industries. And a lot of um, a lot of these CSN standards are still evolving. They're still very new, uh, but as a whole, um, these are really grouped into four categories. One is around time synchronization and enabling that to be a lot, uh, uh, a lot allowing systems to be synced up, to, uh, even though they may be disparate systems, allowing more syncage there. Two is around uh, more deterministic uh, communication, uh, giving uh, more predictable or bounded time uh, for, for different systems to interact. Uh, three is around redundant, a uh, high availability of redundant networking. So that's uh, uh, priority to cr critical data types over other types of data types. Um, and then the number number four is uh, standardizing so that uh, one management or configuration tool across different types of protocols. So being able to kind of uh, standardize and, and manage that in interoperability at a much lower level. Um, so a lot is still yet to come on PSN, and we look at we look to see how that continues to evolve in the industry. Um, but as we, you know, as we see that evolving, one of the things that we in, inside of TI are doing are creating products that will be able to uh, actually support PSN in the future. So kind of walk, walk you through a little bit of what that architecture could look like. Um, right, so at a high level, you've got an integrated device that really has all these different elements kind of captured in. So one got the performance to handle uh, real-time communication, real-time cores, um, with the potential for even application cores if you're building an HMI system or, or uh, uh, even cloud-based systems to being able to extend that application even further. Um, two is around functional safety and security. So as these uh, systems go from centralized to more decentralized, for example, um, and as we start going towards more automation, uh, where robots and manufacturing assembly is actually working alongside humans, right, functional safety uh, becomes very critical, um, and data security and uh, privacy also becomes critical. Um, having support for industrial communication subsystems. So a separate block kind of really isolating a lot of that real-time uh, real communication. Um, obvious support for industrial Ethernet as well as extending that to gigabit Ethernet, uh, multi-port and um, multiple ports. Um, motor control, uh, if you're doing type of real-time control, or power control. Uh, and then processing scalability. So we've got pin-to-pin -pin options that kind of goes from you know, the smaller MCUs all the way to higher end uh, processors um, that can layer in a lot more capabilities um, as needed. So we will look across uh, the portfolio. Um, for example, we at CI have uh, a number of products uh, that uh, we have already um, uh, available today and, and uh, are are uh, fully built with software uh, to devices that we even are continuing to invest in um, in the near future um, that will continue to, to enable uh, Industry 4.0, right, as we, even as we move into more of the PSN. Uh, so that's on the microcontroller side with the R5 base cores. Um, you'll see that on uh, TI's uh, website with the AM2426X family going to uh, our processor cores that starts to layer in Cortex-A devices um, with support for uh, other OSs like Linux or Android, and then continue to extend that even further uh, with our um, AM68, 69A families and DRA8X families um, that start to also bring in uh, much higher levels of, let's say, analytics right on top of a lot of that. So it's kind of talked a little bit about more of the field level communication and the kind of the mid level and then the operator level uh, just nicely expands. This portfolio also can nicely span a lot of those applications as well. So <clears throat> with that, um, you can kind of see this is 
another way of showing it. So field level, control level, operator level, how a lot of our portfolio today stacks in. Um, so uh, feel free to uh, check us out on PI.com. We've got a ton of content uh, available, um, both in getting started, um, evaluation platform, uh, as well as uh, uh, demonstrate a, we actually have um, really cool demonstrations uh, that we can show, um, and we'd love to show you more. But all of this would not be possible without very strong uh, partners uh, in this space as well. And that's where uh, TI actually uh, works with a lot of uh, our key ecosystem partners to really make sure that um, we can provide not just the silicon, but also the software uh, that uh, our customers need to really get started quickly. So if you look on our website today, you'll find that uh, TI actually provides um, one certified TI development platform. So these are certified, protocol certified um, uh, on, our, on our TI EDM, our TI development uh, board. Our SDK uh, actually includes a lot of these uh, protocol stacks um, as part of that. Uh, and, uh, and customers can actually get the devices that are fully enabled with these protocols, um, all including the staff license um, directly from TI. And then as, continue, as TI continues to invest in the space and continues to add to its offering, right, those feature updates um, and even software support come directly from TI as well. So uh, we're very excited about our kind of full portfolio offering that we have in this space. Uh, and then in addition, right, we also work with a lot of uh, key third parties in this space that can uh, actually continue to add to our offering by uh, providing other features as well. If you'd like to see kind of what these uh, partners offer, you know, feel free to check them out. But we're, we have some pretty uh, – um, uh, a pretty uh, good players or pretty good ecosystem partners that our customers can work with to help their products get, get out to the market even faster. So with that, uh, I do want to um, pause right here and uh, actually take a look at uh, some of the Q&A. So if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to um, send them in um, and uh, we'll actually take them at this time. Okay, so uh, one question, how do I purchase a part that supports the protocol? Uh, so our devices that actually support those protocols are available. Um, you can actually find the information on our website on ti.com. So a lot of the products uh, that, uh, that I shared with or mentioned today, um, if you look actually it, within the data sheet, we actually list out which products um, support which protocol so you can actually get them uh, that way. And we actually have additional material on our website as well. <clears throat> um, I think I see another question around uh, uh, what uh, software do our ecosystem partners support? Um, a lot of those questions, or a lot of those uh, details of, on exactly what they're off, are their exact offering um, on which TI platform and what is their specific offering, that information is actually available on their website. Uh, so feel free to check out their website. Um, since given that TI has such a large portfolio in this space, uh, a lot of our partners, um, you know, kind of hone in on very specific uh, uh, software offerings. Uh, so a lot of that information can be found directly, uh, directly through them. If I have if uh, I have an issue with a protocol, how does TI support? Ah, great question. So a lot of um, uh, a lot of customers, as they are developing their their product, um, have access to our TI E to E community, uh, and that community actually uh, enables customers to freely ask whatever questions that they may have as they're going through the development, um, as well as uh, 
uh, offer opportunity for our engineers to provide direction, additional direction as needed. So um, if you have an issue or, uh, you know, in getting it working or, or trying to adjust the setting or whatever uh, and are getting, feeling through it like you're getting stuck, um, not to worry, our TIEDE is a great place to go, a great resource uh, where we actually have our engineers um, supporting customers, many customers today, and you can ask, uh, feel free to ask away. Will PI expand its product offering in the future? Can PI continue to uh, expand its product offering, both on the silicon side as well as on the software side as well. Um, and we continue to work with our ecosystem partners um, in this space in addition. Um, just like TI was there in the early days of uh, in, in, you know, factory automation and in industry 1.0, 2.0, uh, you know, this is a key area uh, that uh, TI plans to um, it, it continue to grow its offering. So, You'll see, uh, for example, from software release, from one software release to the next, we uh, continue to add, add features, uh, and we continue to add new products um, in this space. So um, actually one very cool area that I'm very excited about. Another question that came in, do I need to go through TI? to work with third parties that you mentioned. Um, you, so actually, TI offers uh, uh, both ways, right? So customers want to come directly to TI and get a lot of the licenses and stack directly from uh, TI. Uh, they're, they're able to do so. And our product on our website actually will give you more information on which products support which protocols. For some customers, uh, for other customers that uh, prefer to use their own, uh, for example, a stack vendor or maybe have their own customized version of a stack that they'd like um, instead, like to use instead, um, we provide that flexibility as well. So it really allows, you know, we really give the flexibility to the end customer, the end user to decide um, how much of uh, that software they would like from TI or to, from TI to provide. Uh, versus how much of it they would like to go and um, have their, have to add on their own. Um, that flexibility is uh, with the customer. Do you, another question that just came in, do you have, I have a system today, do you have um, EtherCAD or Ethernet IP, which I need, already certified? We actually do. So um, if you actually go to our, our TI and um, download our SDK, you'll see uh, today that we actually have Ethernet, EtherCAT and Ethernet IP certified, and uh, we'll continue to add um, as, uh, as time goes on. All right, I think we've got time for maybe one more question here. <clears throat> Where do I find data sheets? So all of our data sheets for our products are available on TI.com. You go to our uh, website today uh, and go to any of the product pages. Uh, our, our data sheet the, it would be actually the very top link of the product. Uh, and uh, you know, feel free to check that out. We also, in addition, have uh, protocol data sheets. Uh, so for not in addition to just the, the software data sheets um, and the device data sheets, but we also have uh, data sheets available for protocols. If you can't find them, feel free to put in a question on our TIEDE, and we can definitely help you there. All right. I think we've, uh, we're going to wrap it up for the day. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, if you would like to uh, learn more, um, please visit ti.com slash NTU or join us next week for uh, next week's uh, new product updates. And we'll love to see you then. Hope this was uh, very enlightening for you all. Thank you.